Hey, what's going on guys? Ray Shapley, where to live in Austin. And in this video, we're going to be talking about things you should know before building a home. So a couple things to keep in mind up front. The first is that this is based on my experience selling homes in Austin, Texas. I've worked with builders for over a decade here. Some of the information is going to vary depending on where you're building, but I'd say that 90 plus percent of this information is going to be applicable no matter where you are. The next thing I'll say is that this is really based around production builders. So these are builders who build out complete neighborhoods or sections of neighborhoods, not custom builders. But I would say the vast majority of people building are building through a production builder, so it should be relevant. Last but not least, this is really going to be a two-part video. There's just too much to put in one video. So link in the description below for part two of this uh, series. All right, let's get started. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about builder quality. This is something that I think everyone wants to know. Is the builder any good who's building my home? But the question is not that easily answered, simply because, as many of you may have found out already, just going online looking at reviews is not that helpful. It's not helpful for a couple reasons. The first one is, is that any builder doing any amount of volume will have some bad reviews. They just will. And sometimes it's the builder's fault, and sometimes it has nothing to do with the builder because expectations set um, are not, they're not really set properly. A lot of people have never built a home. A lot of people have never owned a home. A lot of people are coming from an apartment. They're used to having their light bulbs changed for them and things like that. So there's all different levels of expectations set up front for these builders. And sometimes the bu builders do a good job and get a bad review. And sometimes they do a bad job and get a bad review. There's just no way of knowing. The other thing is, is that there's really two components to builder quality or what's perceived as builder quality. The first is how a house is assembled, how it's put together. The next is how they deal with screw ups or mistakes after the fact. And both of those things go together to kind of form the quality of the builder, right? In people's minds. So let's address that first thing, how well a home's put together. Well, here's the thing. How well a home is put together isn't necessarily going to be dictated by the corporate structure that you're seeing online, the uh, Toll Brothers or the uh, Ashton Woods or whomever it is. That's the kind of corporate umbrella, corporation, whatever. But the important thing to understand is when you go into a specific neighborhood, onto a specific job site, there's someone managing that. And that person is going to have far more control over the quality of your home than the corporate name of the company. Here's the thing. Within a given price point, all the builders are going to use similar materials and similar subcontractors. It's how those materials are installed and how those subcontractors are managed that's really going to dictate how well that home is built. That's what matters. And that's under the control of who's managing or running the supervisor or super superintendent, whatever the title is in the particular neighborhood you're building in, but that's that person. So the question is, how do we know if that person's any good? This is where it gets a little complicated and you may or may not want to do it. I would recommend doing it if you're serious about it, but just understand it's a little bit of work. So me personally, I grew up when I was a kid, I built houses. I was a framer. I understand how homes go together. So I can go to a job site today for my client or for myself or whatever and walk it. And I get a pretty good sense for, okay, how does this person take care of materials that aren't in use? How are they sealing things up? Is water penetration really high on their priority list? Are they, are they, you know, do they have really good attention to detail? How clean do they keep their job site? All of these things that I think go to pattern and tell me a story about who is running that neighborhood. I understand that you probably don't have the background that I do, but what you can do is, you know, look in your network. Chances are you may know someone or someone's husband or someone's wife or cousin or someone has come up in the trades and understands how a house is supposed to go together. See if you can get them to accompany you in one evening and just walk it and see, get their opinion. You can also hire handymen. So you can go on Yelp or something like that look through the different handymen out there. A lot of these folks are retired tradesmen. So they may have you know, worked in the trades for most of their life and now they've retired and do handyman work. You can look there. Um, you can also uh, always you know, look for an inspector you can hire. You're probably gonna use an inspector in the process and I'll get to that later on in the video, but look to an inspector who's 
got some job site experience, who's in, inspected some homes, some job sites before, or maybe worked in the in, in a different industry on homes. See if you can hire them to come out and do the same thing. Again, guys, I know that's kind of a pain in the neck, but if you really want to understand the quality in terms of how well your home is going to go together, that's probably the only way to really get a good insight into that. Now let's talk about the second component of a quality build, which is how well that builder handles issues after the fact. This is going to be a lot easier to research online. Go ahead and look online. You'll definitely see complaints, whatever builder it is, but read the complaints and see if they sound legitimate. Some of these folks are going to have wild expectations and others are not. So look into that. Then the other thing you want to do is when you're talking with the builder or the builder sales rep, you can also ask, hey, do you do your own warranty work or do you have a third party company carry out your warranties for you? Because a lot of these builders are going to third party companies. And this can be good or bad, just depending on that company. So then you're going to want to look at that specific company, see what their procedure is for what they call warranty claims. Then you can kind of get a better assessment of, okay, how much of a pain in the neck is this going to be? The last thing you should do is go walk the neighborhood on a Saturday or Sunday. And if you see someone out doing yard work, someone who lives there, go ask them, hey, who was your builder? Uh, what was your experience? Did you have any problems? And, it, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to have a problem or two after someone moves in on a new build. It's the, the question is, how did the builder handle it? And hopefully you'll get the answer there. Guys, I know that seems like a lot, but if you really want to get a good handle on who you're dealing with as a builder, that's how you do it. Okay, so we got to talk about design centers. Design centers are a really interesting thing, and it can be a real fun part of the process, but it's also a place where people can go crazy and spend way too much money. So design centers are places, if you haven't worked with a builder before, it's where you can go see all of their different selections. And at least here in Central Texas, when you go to a design center, it's an experience. I mean, it's a showroom and a half, and this is where the trouble starts. So understand this. When you build a house, there's, there's kind of a set range that you want to spend in that design center, and you really don't want to go above it. It really varies from neighborhood to neighborhood, but a general, a general sense is like 10 to 15% of your base price, right? So if you're building... Whatever your, your home starts at in terms of pricing, take 10 to 15% of that number, and that's what you should probably spend in that design center. You can also ask the sales rep in the neighborhood you're building in what the average spend is. Personally, I think if you're spending over, say, 15% in the design center of the base price, you're probably overspending on the home. The next thing to understand is that design centers are a lot, they're like the casinos of the building industry. They're fun to go to and they're designed to get you to spend a lot of money. And that's the game, right? Because the way it works in design centers is everything is kind of in the world of comparison. Uh, there's this famous quote I love, comparison is the thief of joy. And it's so true in the design center. And what I mean by that is you go in there and let's say, Standard on the home, the builder does a great job and they give you this really nice uh, Kohler sink, right? It's a good brand. It looks fantastic. It's, you know, got clean lines and it's going to be a great looking sink. But you go in and you realize that um, in the design center, they've got five other sinks lined up and they are, you know, there's $1,500 upgrades. There's two $2,500 upgrade sinks and they look amazing and they're right out of like architectural digest. Well, if you're seeing them compared like that, the, the, the sink that was standard that came with your home maybe isn't so great anymore. And it, you know, doesn't look as good. But in reality, by itself in your home, it would look fantastic. So you got to keep that in mind. And if you're someone who tends to get caught up in these moments and can get kind of sucked in and spend too much too fast, Definitely take, you know, use the buddy system. Take someone with you who is kind of the uh, kind of the Debbie Downer when it comes to spending, you know. Sometimes it's your realtor. Some realtors are good at that. Some aren't. Um, sometimes it's a friend, uh, a spouse, whatever. But someone who can say, hey, no, I wouldn't do that. that. That's a waste of money. Don't spend there. That's a good voice of reason to have with you. I assure you, if you're going into to the type of design center I'm used to going into, I would highly recommend it. The next thing to know about design centers is go in with a plan. And I know that sounds like, well, yeah, clearly, but you need a plan and a budget. And this is why. 
we know what the budget should be, 10 to 15%. Decide that in advance. Give yourself some flexibility. But the plan is important because not just from a money standpoint, but design-wise, aesthetically speaking, you can get pulled off track and end up with kind of a mess. Here's what I mean by that. So let's say you have a certain style you like. You go in there, you're seeing just some amazing options, things you weren't even planning on you know, getting into or implementing in the home. And all next thing you know, you're choosing these. There's different styles going on, but they all look so amazing. Before long, you just have this hodgepodge and this whole mix of different looks. And it's not, it's not going to be pretty. And it's going to cost you a lot of money. What I recommend doing, go into Pinterest, create a folder a few weeks in advance, and just start, spend some time getting the look. You should have a consistent look that you keep coming across that you're seeing that you like. Put that in your folder and go back and re-examine a day later, you'll realize there is a certain theme that you like in homes. No matter who you are, you're going to kind of see some commonalities. Prune that a little bit, figure out, you know, a really clean theme that you like in there, and then take that, take your phone into the design center and use that as a reference point. Keep going back to that. If it doesn't fit that template that you've kind of chosen for yourself in your own spare time, then it just doesn't fit and you don't need to do it. And you can always do it later if it's something that you decide you love down the road. So um, that's the best way, I think, to stay consistent because you you don't have to spend a lot of money in a design center to make a house look really, really good. Designers will tell you that it's really about color and texture and principles like mix don't match, things like that, than it is what brand of sink faucet or what level of granite you have. That stuff, while you can spend a lot of money there, doesn't really make a cohesive look. The cohesive look is done through colors and textures, and you can do that at any level offered by that builder as long as you have a plan going in. Okay, so you, should you have an inspector come out and look at a new build home? Well, typically the answer is yes, but I'll explain. There's actually a couple of key times I would want that inspector to come out. The first thing to understand is where you're building the home matters. If, you, if I'm building a home in the city of Austin, I know that city inspectors are coming out at every phase from foundation pour to framing to electrical, plumbing, sheetrock. They're being inspected. Now, granted, those the city inspectors are not the same caliber inspector that I would hire, but at least I know that someone's looking and making sure basic code requirements are satisfied. Building out in the county there's not going to be anyone looking at that home other than the guys are building it. So understand that that's definitely a situation where I would want to have my own inspector go out. Now, when that inspector should go out, I think there's two key times. The first is right before sheetrock. So this is before the walls are sealed up so they can walk around and look at how things were installed behind the walls. The next time I would have them out is not till after I've lived in the home. So in Texas and, and I think in most states, Builders are required to give a one-year, what they call bumper-to-bumper -bumper or door-to-door -door warranty. This means that within that first year, if anything goes wrong, and in theory, they will fix it. So what I would do is get the inspector out there in month 11 after you've moved into the home. So this way, the house is settled. The, the one or two sheetrock screws have popped out. The shingle is blown off the, the roof different things that were going to happen as the house kind of broke itself in in that first year have already happened. Now you get the inspector to take a look. They hand you the report. You hand that report to the builder and say, these are the things I need fixed. Now, it's important to let the builder know that you're going to do that. So when, when you're interviewing or talking to builders, say, hey, here's what I plan to do. I'm going to have an inspector out pre sheetrock and I'm going to have an inspector out in month 11 and then I'm going to turn everything over to you guys to be fixed. If the builder has a problem with that, you really should dig into why because that's a bit of a red flag for me. The builder should be totally okay with that. <laughs>